morning. Jackson Katz is an educator, author, filmmaker, and social theorist who is internationally renowned for his pioneering scholarship and activism on issues of gender, race, and violence. So I'm going to begin by sharing with you a paradigm shifting perspective on the issues of domestic violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, the sexual abuse of children, and that whole range of issues that are referred to in shorthand as gender violence issues, which historically have been considered, as you know, women's issues that some good men help out with. And a big part of my work for the past you know, 35 years has been to try to shift the paradigm on this question. I don't accept the premise that these are women's issues that good men help out with. In fact, I'm going to argue that these are men's issues. And I'm looking around the room, and I'm just saying from my immediate visual uh, assessment of the attendees that there's a disproportionate number of women vis-a-vis -vis men and a binary understanding of women and men. Is that a safe, is my perception correct? Yes. There's not a whole lot of people who are men or identify as men in this room. Is that, a, is that what everybody else is seeing? All right. Now this is a structural challenge in this work and hopefully both with my comments and commentary as well as in some of the interactive pieces we can we can uh, think through that one a little bit like how we can change that let me let me just give you a, a little bit of a, 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 a what do you call it a, a preview of, of my feeling about that subject <laughs> this not this cannot be voluntary if we want to do, do systematic social change on the issues of gender violence we need to figure out ways to make it marbled into the uh, routine and organically marbled into educational practice, leadership training, institutional practice at all levels. It cannot be optional for the men who are good enough, if you will, or care enough so that they show up for events that are optional. That's not social change. That's not massive social transformation. Our culture could go on for decade after decade. In fact, it has gone on for decades. It could go on for centuries without much change if we're just relying on a handful of men to join the women who are at the forefront of all this work. And that means that it has to be literally institutionalized as a priority, not an optional thing. I was tw when I was 20 years old as a college student activist back in the late Mesozoic era, <laughs> I was already done with the idea of voluntary men's participation in gender violence prevention. I started student organizations when I was a young guy. In the, you know, we'd have in the campus center, we'd have a, like, you know, room, 327 on Tuesday night, 7 p.m., for the men who want to join this organization that's going to work against men's violence against women. And there'd be one, two, or three of us in the room waiting for who's going to show up. That's not a transformative model for social change, okay? That's like saying, with white, with, with the very direct analogy is white people and racism. If you want white people to engage with racism, it's not about hoping that white people will show up to deal with an, you know, an anti-racist workshop. It's got to be an institutional priority and that everybody shows up. It's not optional. And if you do it that way, by the way, with men in, in, in all kinds of different institutional practices, what you're going to find is that a lot of men will come through the door who would never have come through the door voluntarily. But once they're through the door, they'll, their life can be transformed, and they can become strong leaders and allies on this work. And I've been doing this work, and my, other, my colleagues have been doing it for a long time, and I'm just saying, I know this, this is not a theoretical proposition. This is what happens. When you get guys in the room talking about this stuff and engaging, you find a lot more people who end up staying in the room and becoming involved. But you've got to get them in the room in the first place, and that's about institutional leadership and priorities. Can I ask you a question? How many people here are directly involved in educational institutions right now, either high school, college, or anywhere else? Okay. So let me just thank you. Let me just give you a, a one example of what I'm talking about. I, I've been working and giving talks and trainings on college campuses for you know 30 years, and I tell you, you hear university presidents say all the time, they'll get in front of the cameras and say. There's no greater priority than the safety of our students. There's no greater priority than reducing violence among our students. And then you'll find out, okay, what, okay, it's, a, it's no greater priority, okay? So what is, what are the requirements for your students around these matters? And then you'll find, oh, maybe it's not such a priority. Oh, we, we require all our incoming first year students to do online training. It's like, uh, you just said that this is a priority, and now you're saying that it's online training is how you're taking care of that, and we have, you know, we have a, a requirement where all members of the Greek organizations have to come in and every, you know, swipe their card and listen to a speaker like me, 
or some theater troupe putting on some bystander uh, scenarios, and then they swipe their card, and they've done sexual assault prevention training for the semester, what I would suggest to those university presidents is don't bother saying it's a priority if you're not going to back it up, because it's total BS. It's obviously not a priority. One last thing, I was at a, an elite school, this is in the Midwest, this is a few years ago, and I was meeting with a group of administrators. This is not my brilliant talk, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I was meeting with a group of administrators, and I, in the course of my visit there, I was doing a bunch of things, and one of them was this meeting, and it was about sexual assault prevention. And there was uh, seven people in the meeting, including me, and there was five, uh, there was only one man other than me. Okay, so it was so the first message that's being sent is the people on the campus, the administrators on the campus who are concerned with this, were all women. Unless the unless it was the fact the fact that eighty percent of the campus administrators were women, that sent a message right away. Okay, so five out of six of the people on campus who were who were at this meeting with me were women, and the subject is sexual assault prevention. And then one of the one of the women in the in the group said to me. Um, she said, you know, this is a real priority here on our campus, but we're having a real, you know, sexual assault prevention, we have some issues, but we're having a real problem um, getting men engaged, so do you have some suggestions? And I said, well, what are your requirements? What are your, what are your in, you know, the training requirements, the programmatic requirements, both on the curricular side and the student services side? And you know what she said? She said, oh, well, we have an opt-in culture on this campus. We don't require things. And I, so, so, so she's already contradicted herself, right? It's not a priority if it's an opt-in culture. And I said, if you want to graduate from this university, this college, with a degree in math, can you say that I don't feel like taking calculus? <laughs> you can't. In other words, the university or colleges are constantly saying what is required of your graduation. If you want to say you've graduated from this institution with this degree, these are the requirements. And you don't have a choice. If you're a student going to that campus, that's part of your education. In other words, this is a failure of the institutions, not of the students, to make this a priority and back it up with building it in, and I say marbling it in organically into the educational practice. And I use the word marbling it into the educational practice because people often hear, we don't want mandatory program, because if you have a mandatory program, people come in with their arms folded, and they, you know, they don't really, I, I hate how people think like that, but I, people say that all the time. Maybe some of you have said that before. You don't want it to be mandatory because people will be people meaning men will be defensive coming in. And so I would use different language rather than mandatory to say you build it in organically as an expectation, not a hope, and then you'll see what happens. Change will happen much more quickly than it's currently happening, to be honest with you, because if you engage men on a much more fundamental level, which is the only true solution to my, in my thinking to the, to the prevention side of the house, is, is much more systematically engaging men, um, things will happen much more quickly and change will happen much more quickly than it's currently happening. Um, sorry, I've long lamented that designers of podiums <laughs> rarely have figured out that if it's on a slope and people need water, <laughs> In fairness, there is a shelf, but it's busy right now. And this thing will fall right over if I put it on the shelf. And we're at altitude, right? Yeah. I flew in from the lowlands, and so I know that I have to drink water or I'm going to pass out up here. So I'm, I think it's better that I take an interruption than drink some water, then I pass out. What do you think? I agree. I agree. All right. I agree. All right. Uh, um, so, I was saying at the beginning that I uh, have been working on this paradigm shift and not accepting the premise that these are women's issues that good men help out with, but that are in fact men's issues. Let me say, I of course understand that they're women's issues. So let me just say, it's clear that these are women's issues as well. In, in fact, women are profoundly affected on a personal level, on a professional level, on a political level, on every level uh, on these matters. Globally, not just locally, this, is, this cuts, cuts across all the categories of Socioeconomics, race, ethnicity, religion, education level, you name it. I mean, obviously women are profoundly affected, but not just affected. Women, women's leadership has been utterly transformative in a world historical sense on these very matters. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about women's leadership right at the beginning because I'm going to shift gears and say that the missing piece is men's leadership. But let me just make, make it clear that 
none of the men doing the work that I, I'm doing and the other men in this room and more out there and hopefully much more in coming years, many more. Um, the work that we're doing is all built on the uh, foundation of women's work and leadership. So here's a couple examples of women's leadership, okay? Let's talk about um, the domestic violence movement, right? The domestic violence movement. Men have been assaulting women and children and other men in families and relationships for thousands of years. This is not a new problem in our species, right? But there was no such thing as a battered women's program until the 1970s. There were no shelters like Safe Shelter. There weren't 800 numbers for victims and survivors to call. There weren't trained counselors on either uh, a college campus or in communities to deal with the needs of victims and survivors. None of that architecture of support that many of us take for granted today in the United States for victims and survivors even existed until the 1970s. And by the way, there's many countries in the world today, including in wealthy countries in Europe, that have minimal levels of support for victims and survivors compared to what their resources are. It's, it's shameful how little there is in terms of the architectural support on these issues in a lot of wealthy European countries, not just poor developing world countries. Um, and we have a long way to go, but we've made a lot of progress in, in this country, and, a, and, and mostly because of the leadership and ad, activism and advocacy of women with some men who have been supportive all along, right? Uh, not enough, but some. Um, there was very little offender accountability back in the day, which is to say the typical or stereotypical domestic violence call that law enforcement would, would, would go out on, they would, the, 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 the um, sort of, the, the animating sort of um, focus would be to separate the parties. So, so they would say to the guy, go take a walk, go get a cup of coffee, leave, get, get out of here. In other words, sober up or, or, or cool off, as opposed to, and a crime has committed, been committed, and we've got to figure out how we're going to address the crime that, that's been committed. It's more like, okay, we've got a family squabble. How do we keep the people apart? I mean, law enforcement's made a lot of progress in the last generation or two, but they, they've got a long way to go, too, but they've made a lot of progress. But to the extent that there's a federal accountability built in to the domestic violence world, it's largely, again, the, 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 the political sort of pressure has been from, mostly from women um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the work. And to the extent that it's prevention programming, which there isn't in most of the country, on, in, in high schools and such, because the model that most people use now is if there's a domestic or sexual violence program that has grant money, soft money, to provide for education, prevention education, to go out into the schools, you'll have that in the schools. But if you don't happen to live in a community that has a domestic or sexual violence program right, right close by that has the resources to send out people into the schools, you're not going to have it, which is to say most kids in high schools don't have any domestic and sexual violence prevention education. And there's places in the, in the country where, in big cities, for example, like where I used to live in Long Beach, California, where there'd be 500,000 people. In the city of Long Beach alone, there's a half a million people, but the catchment area of the domestic and sexual violence program is like two million people, and there would be like two paid staff and 10 volunteers to, to reach 22 communities with like two and a half million people. Are you kidding? That's the status quo right now. Most kids graduate from high school with no or very minimal domestic and sexual violence prevention education. To the extent that it exists, it's because of women's advocacy and leadership. So shifting gears, that's domestic violence. To sexual assault and, and women's leadership in that area, um, men have been sexually assaulting women and children and other men in relationships, in families, and in the broader community for thousands of years. Again, not a recent problem in our species, but there was no such thing as a rape crisis center until the 1970s. There weren't hotlines and 800 numbers for victims and survivors to call. There was none of that architecture of support that we take for granted. The trained counselors on college campuses and communities, trained law enforcement to deal not just sensitively but professionally with the needs of victims and survivors. None of that existed until the 1970s, until women said, we need this, we demand this. Um, and uh, very little offender accountability on sexual assault back in the day. In fact, when I started working with the United States Department of Defense, my colleagues and I in 1997, just prior to our arrival in that space, um, the, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the UCMJ, which is the legal document governing the United States military, had been amended in its definition of rape the old definition said something like this. When a man has carnal knowledge with a woman, comma, not his wife, comma, against her will, he has committed rape. 
There's lots of problems with that definition. One of them is the heteronormativity of the definition, suggesting that the only type of rape is a man raping a woman. But the not his wife clause meant that in the Uniform Code of Military Justice until the mid-1990s, a man couldn't legally rape his own wife. That's not that long ago. And as late as the 1980s, as recently as the 1980s, there was something like six states in the United States where it was still legal for a man to rape his own wife. And today, as we speak, there's approximately a billion people live in countries where it is still legal for a man to rape his wife. So we've come a long way as a species, but we have a long way to go. And again, to the extent that we've come a long way, it's mostly because of women's advocacy and leadership. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about this leadership. A lot of misconceptions. And one of them is that women and girls have somehow benefited. Yeah, OK, we have, you know, we have these programs, we have the services, we have the support for women and girls. But men and boys, not so much. And some people even think that men and boys have been pushed backwards. And somehow, as women have advanced, men have been pushed backwards. Like it's a zero-sum game. And you know, one wins, the other loses. And, um, <clears throat> but the idea is that somehow, uh, I mean, some people, it's a small number, but it's, not, it's real, believe that men have been, and boys have been pushed backwards as women have advanced. That's, in a nutshell, the men's rights argument, which I think is um, nonsense. And I'm not going to give it any more airtime right now. But if you want to ask questions, we can talk about it. But I think that the majority of people in the general population, such as it is, don't believe that men and boys have been pushed backwards. They just believe men and boys are needy and need more attention, and need more attention to their mental health needs, their you know emotional and developmental challenges, which, by the way, I agree with, and every woman and man that I've ever worked with in this field agrees with. Okay, So it's not a controversial point to say that we need more attention to the emotional and developmental needs of boys and men. You don't have to have a PhD in, you know, in anything to know that it's like the, the, the daily news in the United States and all over the world is a catalog of our failure to socialize boys into becoming decent human beings. The, the number of the daily news is a literal catalog of male dysfunction and abuse in this country and all over the world. This obviously we're not doing well, comparatively speaking, in the way that we define manhood, socialize boys, the the sort of the carnage is everywhere from our failure. Don't you think? Yes. So it's not a controversial point to say that it's that we need more attention to the needs of boys and men. But the idea that somehow men and boys have not been affected somehow by women's advocacy in the domestic and sexual violence field is absolute ignorance. Okay? And I'm going to give you two examples of how men and lives bo men and boys' lives have profoundly been affected in a positive way by women's advocacy and leadership in the domestic and sexual violence field. The first has to do with um, domestic violence and its effects on children. Okay, So in the field, we've been talking about this subject for the last 25 years at least, the effects of domestic violence on children. All the children growing up in homes where their father abuses their mother, their mother's boyfriend abuses their mother. Sometimes the mother is the abuser. This is also true in gay male relationships and lesbian relationships and other social arrangements. There's an awful lot of kids in our society, in Colorado and every state, growing up being exposed to, quote, domestic violence. There's a term that people have used in the field for the past quarter century to describe those children. It's called children who witness domestic violence. And many of you know this and use the term. This is a term that I don't like, OK, children who witness domestic violence. It's a term that I don't like and I don't use. You know why? Because if you're a seven-year-old kid cowering in the closet as your father or another man is raging against your mother, you're not a witness. You're a victim. You're not observing something happening to somebody else. You're experiencing it happening to yourself. The experience of trauma is much more immediate and profound than is suggested by the passive word witness. Well, guess what? The category of children who are being traumatized in this way includes not just girls, but also boys. Do you have any idea how many boys in our society, as we speak, are in these kind of situations? Do you have any idea how many boys are in the juvenile system in the state of Colorado and every state who are in the system in part because their life journey started out as traumatized little boys in situations where they, they didn't know what to do with the trauma. And they, so they took the traditional path that we, we so often give to boys and men who have experienced trauma, which is somebody took something from me, I'm going to take it from somebody else, which is why boys who have been abused 
are something like 10 times more likely to become abusive of others than boys who have not. The prisons of the state of Colorado and every state are filled with chronologically adult men who, underneath the tatted up bodies and the badass attitudes, are often little boys, emotionally and developmentally, who early in life develop this hard shell, a defensive sort of shell against the violence and trauma that they experienced. And then many of them emptied up. Because once you, once you buy into that, like probe that pose, you end up going, some of you end up going down a path where you have to you know, engaging yourself in, in violent behavior, and it's a bad, you know, and predictable path. Um, and I'm not making excuses, by the way, for boys and men who act out violently against others. Okay, let me, let me say this, because in the United States, the, the discourse, the public conversation about crime and punishment for the past half century has been so ignorant and impoverished that any time that anybody like me or anybody else starts trying to understand why we have some of these problems, why we have some, in other words, the roots of some of the violence and criminal behavior that we see is that there's going to be somebody and a whole political movement that's ready to shout you down and say, you're making excuses for bad behavior. What about personal responsibility? In other words, just trying to understand behavior, trying to understand the relationship between institutional practices and predictable outcomes means that you're excusing bad behavior. It's the most anti-intellectual, ignorant thing you can imagine. But it shuts down thoughtful conversation because people don't want to be seen as making excuses for bad behavior. Understanding the causes of abuse and violence is not excusing violence and abuse. We homo sapiens have a big enough brain that we can hold in our head more than one thought at the same time. Sometimes we can hold two, three, four <laughs> thoughts in our head at the same time, which is to say we can hold individuals accountable for their behavior at the same time that we look for patterns, we look for institutional practices, we look for the social, you know, things like what, how are we socializing boys, how are we defining manhood, what's the role the media culture plays in that, what's the role the porn culture plays in that, how do we, how do we take young boys who are born every bit as empathetic and, you know, and compassionate as young female children are, how, how do we take young male children and then, you know, from that healthy little loving, you know, child and build him into the kind of guys that do the kind of violence that we see. How do we change that? Just trying to understand that is not defending bad behavior and making excuses for it. I'll just, I mean, it has to, again, it has to be said over and over again um, because there's so many um, people who have been misled by that uh, by that notion. Um, by the way, I was talking about boys in the system. Say, that, well, the juvenile system, and then the um, prison system, the, or the, the jail system, the, the adult side of the house. Um, there's, a, there's also, it's also important for me to say, if the younger folks in this room, and not just, and I will, you will define younger very expansively, um, if anybody in this room wants to be part of undoing the system of mass incarceration that has been so uh, damaging, not just to individuals or even for families, but to whole communities and to the whole society on many levels the system of mass incarceration. We have to talk about larger systems like poverty and racism because obviously poverty and racism have everything to do with who ends up in the system. But we also have to talk about violence done to boys and men because so much of, that's a really big one, because so much of the bad behavior done by boys and men has some of its roots in violence done to boys and men. Um, now, I'm talking about the system itself of you know, criminal justice or corrections. Talk about problematic terms that we use. Corrections. Um, but there's an awful lot of men who are not in the system who are walking wounded from trauma. There's millions and millions of men who have not been incarcerated, who have not been held accountable in any legal sense, or haven't committed legal sort of infractions, who are walking wounded, who are adult men who are trying to build and sustain healthy relationships and intimate relationships with, their, with partners, with children, who have a hard time with that because of the trauma that they suffer. There's an awful lot of walking wounded men in our society who are living out in their adult life the trauma of their childhoods. And some of you are familiar with the ACEs study. It's not the only study in the world, but it's an important study. The connecting childhood experiences of violence and trauma and neglect and such 
to adult outcomes is an awful lot of an awful lot of adult men who are damaged by violence in their childhoods and their adolescence. Not all of it's domestic and sexual violence, but a lot of it is, and a lot of it overlaps with it. And I think, by the way, one of the one of the ways to bring in more people into this work and to thinking about these issues more. Uh, expansively is to make all these kinds of connections. When I started working on these issues back in, when I was in college. I didn't have all this language, but I, all, I, I got very early that domestic and sexual violence were not discrete problems. They were much marbled into all kinds of other systemic forces in the world of injustice and inequality and violence. And that if, but that one of the hearts of systemic inequality is gender inequality, and one of the fundamental uh, forces that maintains gender inequality is gender violence. So men's violence against women is the front edge of preventing gender equality. To me, gender equality is, without a doubt, one of the most important, if not the most important force globally for sa you know, saving the human race. So I, and I got all this as a young guy. So in other words, I never understood domestic and sexual violence as just an issue of we need to help victims of domestic violence and sexual assault recover from their, you know, heal from their wounds and hold the offenders accountable. That's a piece of it, but that's only a small piece of it. This is, these are much bigger issues. Uh, domestic and sexual violence are related to virtually every other form of inequality and marbled into those forms of inequality. And I understood this from the beginning. And I'll give you one example of one of those connections. And somebody, and maybe somebody in this room right now is going to be doing a breakout on this subject a little bit later this morning. Uh, um, there's so many relationships between what happens in the family and what happens outside the family. Um, and, and one example is mass shootings, right? So mass shootings is such an incredibly common experience in the United States. And anybody who's traveled internationally knows that people think that we're barbarians in this country, the level of violence that we commit against each other as well as that we tolerate as a society. People think we're barbarians. Um, mass shootings, for example, are a huge issue in other countries. Um, in our country, they're like a 24, 48, 72 hour news cycle now. Wow, that's a bummer, that's a shame, and then we'll move on. Um, but there was a study done, you know, in um, a couple of years ago, the Huffington Post reported that in uh, the last 10 years of uh, mass shootings, defined as four killings in one event, because you can define it differently sometimes, 57% um, of those uh, shootings had a uh, domestic violence connection. 57%, which is to say that the, the perpetrator was either the perpetrator of domestic violence or the victim of domestic violence in well over half of, this, of the uh, mass shootings. So how are we going to have a thoughtful conversation about mass shootings and not talk about domestic violence? Feminist theorists and activists have been for almost 50 years talking about breaking down the artificial dichotomy of the private sphere, the family versus the public sphere. One of the reasons why that dichotomy is so damaging is it's one of the ways that women have been confined historically to the private domain and excluded from public authority, public leadership, because of this notion that somehow their domain was in the family and men's domain was in the public. Um, it's problematic on so many levels. But one of them is that it's a false dichotomy to say that those two are separate because there's so much relationship between the two. And domestic and sexual violence, for example, stuff that happens within the family has so much spillover into, onto the streets. There's so much intersection between domestic and sexual violence and gang violence and youth violence and alcohol and drug addiction and opioid addiction and it, transmission of HIV and I mean, I mean, depression, mental health challenges, all the cascading problems that that causes. And I'm just off the top of my head naming a few. I mean, there's so many more. And so again, I think I'm saying this to people in the field sometimes don't, because you have so much to do in the day-to-day -day basis of taking care of victims and survivors. And it's like, these are bigger picture questions. Like, how do, you, how do you reduce gang violence and not talk about sexual assault and domestic violence? I mean, how do you do youth violence in a, in a, in a city like Boulder or Denver Youth violence, which is another way of saying boys' violence. By the way, there's girls who commit violence. About 15% of youth violence is done by girls. So youth violence is like kind of, a, in my opinion, kind of a euphemism. It's really boys' violence that we're talking about in most cases. I'm not saying it's that girl violence is not real, but it's a very small percentage of the total. Um, anyways, the point is, how do you talk? You have you have these programs all over the country in cities, large and small, where 
There'll be domestic violence people in one sort of silo. There'll be sexual assault people over here. There'll be youth violence people in this in this camp over here. And you'll have the, 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 the gang violence people over here. It's like, are you kidding? They're all related and intersecting, crossing over. And it shouldn't it shouldn't take like yeah. someone like me. Like I part of the work that I've been doing for years is because I come to this, these cities and, I, and we have these conclaves where people meet each other and you know. But that shouldn't have to happen just by chance. It should be in, 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 interconnected all the way. Everybody who works in youth violence and gang violence should be trained in domestic and sexual violence and vice versa. Everybody should know, what are these people being trained? When you're being, when you're being trained in Boulder to deal with the question of youth violence, do you have, is, how much is domestic violence part of that training? How much is sexual assault part of that training? And then vice versa, if you're working in domestic and sexual violence, how much training have you had on you know, gang violence issues and prevention and sexual, excuse me, and uh, quote unquote youth violence. In other words, there's all kinds of overlaps that's not being, that's not being actualized in a lot of the practice of, 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 this, of this work. And it, that needs to change, obviously. Um, so I've just given you a couple examples of how men's and boys' lives have improved by women's advocacy, and when I say that, let me just put a put a put a uh, uh, exclamation point on this. When I say men's lives have improved, the women who started the battered women's movement back in the 70s were talking truth to power 50 years ago. They were saying publicly and privately and every other way that kids should be growing up in families free from violence. Women should be able, and men should be free from violence in the place, the sanctuary of the home and the family, which is supposed to be a sanctuary from the cruel world. That shouldn't be the place where they experience violence and abuse. Those women have been speaking truth to power. They, those women's words and advocacy have been in solidarity, not just with girls and women, but with boys and men, and all the boys who have grown up with, with, these, with, this, with this trauma. And yet, what do they often get? What do you often get for your troubles? These male bashers, these man haters, these feminazis, they got a chip on their shoulder. You know what I mean? You hear that kind of ignorance to this day passed along as common sense. It's outrageous. And I think if one of the things that men need to do, and, and men in this room, this room, but also men more generally, I think one of the things that men need to do is we need to say some of this stuff. And we need to say it loud and proud and publicly because there's not enough men have been saying this stuff loudly and publicly. So, so we need to take some of the criticism that some of the women have been taking unfairly for all these decades. But when men start saying this stuff and doing it much more emphatically, it'll, it'll begin to diminish the power of those kind of take, attempted takedowns of women. In other words, the more men speak out on these matters, the more it becomes normal to hear men in positions of institutional leadership, cultural influence, political, religious leadership, all across the board, the more it becomes normal to hear men talk like this, the less pressure there's going to be on women and the less power that those attacks against women will have in silencing women and intimidating women. Don't you think? And I think men's support for women from, from the back of the room kind of thing or quiet support for women in their lives is a nice thing, but it's not enough. It's not responsive to the reality of the, the level of the problem in our society and in the world. We need more men who are willing to say this stuff really strongly. And by the way, men, when men don't say this stuff really strongly, guess who comes to speak for us? The men who do speak loudly, with their fists, with their guns, or with their ignorant words. Right? And I don't want those men speaking for me. I don't want Rush Limbaugh speaking for me. Okay? <laughs> and if, you don't, if you're a man and you don't want Rush Limbaugh speaking for you, then you have to speak for yourself. And not everybody has the same megaphone as that bombastic boar. Sorry. <laughs> but he's the, he's the person who popularized the term feminazi. Which is an outrageous libel, an outrageous libel. Linking feminists to Nazis. Feminists were at the forefront of working against all forms of violence. Feminists who built the battered women's movement and the sexual assault movements, the movements against sexual abuse of children. And feminists are some of the great anti-violence leaders of our time and of all time. To link feminists with Nazis, which was the, one of the low points in the history, if not the low point in the history of our species, the masculinist, crazy, genocidal, maniac Nazis. To link feminists with Nazis, he should be ashamed of himself. And anybody who uses that term, feminazi, should be ashamed of himself and called out. But that still has currency today in the United States. <laughs>
right? It's kind of a light day, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Sunny, you know, warm, sort of warm, you know, Boulder day. But we, we knew we were coming to a conference on issues. Issues. Right? <laughs> So I've just given you a couple examples of how women's leadership has helped men and boys. And in fact, is one of the best things that's ever happened to men and boys. Feminism is one of the best things that's ever happened to men and boys. Yet I still think that calling domestic and sexual violence women's issues is part of the problem. And for many reasons, the, the most central one is that it gives men an excuse not to pay attention. A lot of men hear the term women's issues and they tune it out, oh, that's just for women. I'm a man, you know. Um, it's it's even, even you know people. A lot of men hear the word gender. A lot of people hear the word gender, and they think it means women. They hear gender issues. They think it means women's issues. In politics, people hear the word gender in politics. They think women in politics. Men are every bit as gendered as women are. I mean, my arg argument in my book, uh, the the, the uh, man enough, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, the politics of presidential masculinity, is that presidential racism has always been about gender. But they've been about the gender is men, and they've been two. They've been a contest between men, but it's still about gender, about manhood, and it's been about white manhood in every election until 2008. Every election was about white manhood. It was about different identities and, and how the country saw itself. This is a very masculine country, by the way. The country sees itself as very masculine. One of the reasons why we haven't had a woman president is because a woman has to navigate the symbolic architecture of the presidency as the embodiment of the national identity, which is man, manly identity. So how does a woman navigate that symbolic architecture? It's a greasy pole, and no woman has succeeded. Hillary Clinton got the farthest, but it's a very difficult thing to do. You know? But people don't see gender unless a woman's running. It's just like saying, it's like saying I, I would argue that the presidency has always been about race. But it wasn't visible until Barack Obama became the first African American or person of color who was contesting at that level, being a nominee of a major party. Then race becomes visible because race was invisible because it was two white guys running against each other. So there was a, it, there was, there was race was invisible, but it was central because, for example, you couldn't imagine it being anything other than two white guys because race is central and gender is central. You know what I mean? A woman runs in 2016, and all of a sudden we start talking about gender. Gender was always there, but we didn't talk about it because it was two men. And because men represent the dominant gender, it goes invisible. This is how it works. And, and so, by the way, when I said when people hear the word gender, they think it means women. It's very similar to people hear the word race. They think it means you know, African American or Latino, Asian American, Native American, South Asian, Pacific Islander, right? Or hetero. Uh, when people talk about sexual orientation, people immediately think, oh, that means gays, lesbians, bisexuals. Because uh, heterosexual is seen as the norm against which others measure themselves, right? So, so part of the challenge, this is conceptual and linguistic, but part of the challenge for those of us who are trying to change the, the paradigm is to break free from these sort of forces, linguistic and otherwise, that keep us in the old paradigm. Um, and that's not an easy thing. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll give, I'm going to give you here a handful of examples of language, because a big part of getting to a new paradigm, right, thinking outside of the old paradigm, is thinking critically about how we're currently thinking. And I want to give you a handful of examples of how we're currently thinking about the, the field, about the subject of domestic and sexual violence that keeps us in the old paradigm. Okay? So, so think about this. Um, A lot of people will ask questions that go something about these subjects that go something like this. How many women were raped on college campuses last year? Rather than, how many men raped women on college campuses last year? People will say things like in the Boulder Unified School District, or the Denver Unified School District, how many, how many girls were sexually harassed last year? Rather than how many boys sexually harassed girls? Or how many girls sexually harassed girls? Or people will say, in the state of Colorado, how many teenage girls got pregnant last year? Rather than how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls. And why do I say men and boys? Because the typical teen pregnancy doesn't result from two 14-year-olds having sex and the girl gets pregnant. It's a 19-year-old guy and a 14-year-old girl. It's a 23-year-old guy and a 15-year-old girl. But when's the last time you saw adult men referred to as a central part of the 
problem or challenge of teen pregnancy? Never. Yeah, never. This is not a coincidence, okay? This is not sloppy thinking. This is how power works, which is through stealth or invisibility or the shifting of accountability off of itself. And again, the challenge for those of us who want to change the paradigm is to make visible some of this stuff that's invisible. Even the term violence against women is problematic. I don't ever use the term violence against women without problematizing it. What's missing from the term? For men, in other words, the active agent is absent. In linguistic terms, violence against women is a bad thing that happens to women, violence against them, but nobody's doing it to them. They're just experiencing it, kind of like the weather. But if you insert the active agent, men, you have a new phrase, men's violence against women. It doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, but it's more accurate, isn't it? It's more honest. Yes, there's women's violence against women. I know there's mother to daughter child abuse, there's lesbian battering, there's peer to peer female abuse, harassment, and violence. I appreciate that, and it's not, it, it's, a, it's an issue. But you know what? The vast majority of violence against women is done by men, and the overwhelming majority of sexual violence against women is done by men. But you wouldn't know it from the phrase violence against women, because men are absent. Do I think it's anti-male to say men's violence against women? Not for one nanosecond do I think it's anti-male. I think it's a factual statement. And I, as a man, am not offended by facts, right? I don't feel like facts discriminate against my gender or some stupid thing like that. It's like, as a man, when I hear this, men's violence against women is this huge problem, I don't like bully bashing men or not all men, you know, this time. Are you kidding me? There's a different way to respond. The way to respond is, okay, this sucks, and I'm a man, and I'm in a position to do something about it. What can I do about it? it seems pretty basic, doesn't it? It's like a white person, again, encountering people of color who are, and others who are outraged about racism. Instead of like, that's not me, I'm not racist. It's like, okay, what can I do as a white person to work against racism if I say I believe in basic concepts like so many Americans say they believe in, like fairness and justice and equality and all that. If I believe in it, then what am I doing about it? And by the way, I think one of the, one of the you know, results of the last few years is that some of us, many of us, have had to uh, rethink what many of us thought were consensus items in the sort of consciousness of our times. In other words, some stuff that we thought was just obvious was a, 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 there was a certain false sense of consensus around what was obvious. And that was revealed in November of 2016, that there are millions of people who, don't, who aren't on the same page about what is obvious. And so I think some stuff needs to be said out loud, that even if you, if you think it's obvious, you need to say it out loud. And I'll give you one example, the difference between guilt and responsibility. And I wrote about this in my book, The Macho Paradox, which a brand new version is coming out in, the, in uh, June, updated, revised for the Me Too era and all that. But uh, the difference between guilt and responsibility so whenever a white person speaks on these ma on matters of race, whenever a, a, a man speaks on it in matters of sexism, or a heterosexual person talks about um, heterosexism, there'll be a chorus of voices that says, that's just liberal guilt, that's just white guilt, that's just, you know, men's guilt, you know, and I don't feel guilty. It's all, okay. <laughs> Let me just say, I don't feel guilty for being a man, for being born male. I don't feel guilty for one nanosecond. I don't feel guilty for being heterosexual. I don't feel guilty for being white. That's silly. It's like, that's who I am. I was born. It's like, I'm not guilty. I feel responsible for being a white person, for being a man, and for being a heterosexual person, and with privilege in other ways, in a society that gives me disproportionate access to the bounties of life. I feel responsible. There's a big difference between guilt and responsibility. Don't you think? So basic, but I don't think that we have a consensus on these kinds of questions in the society. And I think there's a lot of ignorance that just gets continually circulated um, in the United States in 2019. And just saying, I don't, I'm not a rapist. It's not particularly impressive. <laughs> guys, guys shouldn't be getting high fives because they say they don't, you know, they don't uh, beat their girlfriend, right? We need a whole lot more from men. But what we need from men is men who are willing to take some risks in male culture with other men and say, this is not cool. And, and by the way, the more the responsibility you have in terms of in the community, the more influence you have, the more of a platform you have, 
the more power that you have, the more responsibility you have. And Spider-Man's uncle wasn't the first person to say, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> That's a Talmudic saying that goes back thousands of years in you know, Jewish teaching. Great, with great power comes great responsibility. So I would say this is even more so to men who have power, and have power and authority. And, and that means in institutional settings and you know, leadership within you know, academics. For example, I work with a lot of athletic programs, and I have been for years and years. To me, the first place you have to work if you want to, if you want to do successful sexual assault prevention work mm -hmm. in athletics is work with the athletic director, the athletic administrators, and the coaches way before you get to the student athletes. Student athletes have the least power in that system. If you want to work with, um, I mean, in, in any system, really, you've got to look, you've got to look at who's, who's exercising power. Because like in the, in the military, for example, the, the concept of command climate, and I'm going to show you a clip in a minute about, that relates to this. The concept of command climate is everybody has a responsibility for their behavior. The person who has the most responsibility for setting the tone of what goes on within their domain is the commander. So that's called the command climate. That's the response, single and central responsibility of the commander. This is in the corporate world. The single most person most responsible is not the new hire. It's the CEO. It's you know. In other words, the higher you are in the pyramid, the more responsibility you have for setting a tone in that corporation, in that company, in that organization, right? And yet we have all kinds of people all over the world and all over this United States, men in positions of leadership and responsible leadership who have had no training on any of these issues. Mm -hmm. And if they have any training, it's the same training that everybody else gets, which is file into a room and hear the sexual harassment policy explicated by the risk management attorneys and the, maybe, maybe the sexual harassment trainer. It's so ridiculous. So I would say, I would say, I would say talking about uh, silence as complicity is, is, the, is, the, is the basic concept there everybody to, to think about how they can be involved in constructive forward movement and positive social norms change. But I've been very, very frustrated, as one of the architects of the bystander approach, I've been very frustrated at the way it's been implemented on a lot of college campuses and in communities around the country. And maybe including in Boulder and Denver, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, I, you, know, you, you know, you could tell me differently. But, let me just give you some of the basics of the bystander approach as I and my colleagues have been teaching it for years and years because it gives everybody a way to think about how they can be a constructive part of the solution. When I, can I just ask you a question? When I say the bystander approach, how many people feel like they know what that means or are conversant with bystander stuff? Okay, some people have heard the term bystander intervention, right? Term that I don't like, okay? But I'll explain. I'll explain this in a moment. Um, and um, can I say one bridge between the bystander stuff that I've been talking about and and some of the leadership stuff that I was talking about earlier, especially men's leadership, but not exclusively, is the empowered bystander is a leader. Okay, and I've been I've been writing about this and talking about this and training about this for for 26 years now. The empowered bystander is actually a leader. The 15-year-old boy who, who tells his friend who just told a rape joke, that's not funny. That 15-year-old boy has just acted as a leader. You don't have to have a formal designation or title of a leader to be acting as a leader. That's one of the beauties of leadership as a broadly understood concept. And what do I mean by that in the context of the little uh, example I just used? So what does a leader do? A leader, among other things, a leader is somebody who sees a situation, a maybe a harm is happening. A leader then assesses what, is the, what are the dynamics that are going on? What is my responsibility in that situation to the various parties involved, to my own leadership, to the group that I lead, et cetera? What are, this is what a leader has to think through. And then the leader has to think, okay, what are my options? What are my options for acting? And they have to cycle through a series of options and then choose one and do it. So when a 15-year-old boy says to his friend who's just told a rape joke, that's not funny, you can you joke about something else? That 15-year-old boy has executed a leadership protocol because they've essentially gone through what I've just said, even though they may not be conscious of it, all right? And so the, the concept of, of, the, of, the, of leadership and the bystander really work hand in glove. And, and, and I'm gonna now give you a very basic overview of the history of the bystander approach um, to put it in some kind, of, some kind of context, okay? So back in the um, early 90s, I was in graduate school in Boston and I approached the director of an institute at Northeastern University. The institute was called the Center 
for the study of sport and society. And it had been founded in 1984 by a man named Richard Lapchick with the idea of creating initiatives using the sports culture and the power of the sports culture to affect social change. There's a long history in the 20th century of sport being the site of uh, contestation or a range of issues around race, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. Sport is a, is a really important institution in most societies and therefore can be used in a positive way. Anyways, and I knew about all this. I knew about the history of you know, Muhammad Ali using sport as the platform to be a social justice advocate globally. You know, Billie Jean King using sport as an advocate for both women's rights and, and LGBT rights. Um, there's so many other examples. And you know, Colin Kaepernick, the NFL players taking a knee as part of a legacy of social activism around sports. Anyways, I knew about all this. And I was trying to figure out, how do we get more men to speak up on these issues? How do we get more men to stand with women as their partners and allies on these issues of domestic and sexual violence? How do we get more men? And I thought, OK, if we get men who already have some status within their peer culture to speak out, it'll make it easier for other men who are not in the, in this case, the insular athletic subculture. It wasn't about the problem in athletics of male athletes assaulting women. Unfortunately, as a lot of people think, we, that you work with athletes because you, know, you got a problem. It's like you've got a problem in the world Athletes and student athletes on a college campus, for example, have more status, they have more of a platform than most other men on that campus, and so how do you use that in a constructive way? That was my thinking, okay? And at the time, I had a professor in graduate school who, along with his colleagues, was looking at an approach to middle school bullying prevention that moved beyond the perpetrator-victim binary. In other words, instead of focusing on the kid doing the bullying and the kid experiencing it, they focused on all the kids around the kid doing the bullying and all the kids around the kid experiencing it. The goal was to get kids around the kid doing it, to make it clear to that kid that what he or she was doing was unacceptable, not because they were going to get in trouble with the authority figure, like the teacher or the principal, who was going to come into the peer culture and remove the offending party, but because the peer culture was going to police itself. Kids were going to make it clear to other kids, you can't treat kids like this. This is not OK. You're not impressing us. And in fact, you get some issues. And the goal was to get kids <laughs> around the kid experiencing the bullying to make it clear to that kid, we don't appreciate what's happening to you. We don't support it. What can we do to help you help? And they called that the bystander approach. And the beauty of it was that everybody in a peer culture had a role to play, not just confining it to the perpetrator victim binary. And so what, what we did is we took that approach from the middle school bullying world and imported it into the sexual assault and harassment and domestic violence world. And the beauty of it was it gave us something to say to men who would say, as I said earlier, this isn't my issue. I don't rape women. I don't abuse my girlfriend. It's not my problem. It's not my issue. And it was a way to say to them, yes, it is your issue. Because we all reside in peer cultures and in friend, you know, friendship networks on, for teams and fraternities and all that stuff. Now, if you can imagine this, um, well, not, not imagine this. This is, you know, back in the day, the way that people did what they call sexual assault prevention on university and college campuses was organized around this binary understanding, women and men. Um, we know there's a broader spectrum than women and men, but that's how it was organized back in the day. Women and men. Most efforts that called themselves sexual assault prevention efforts back in the 70s and 80s focused on women. And they weren't prevention efforts. They were risk reduction efforts under the name of prevention. So women and girls were taught, don't put your drink down at a party because a guy might drop a rape drug in your drink. Look in the back CD car before you get in. Have a man's voice in the voicemail. All this stuff, right? It's good advice, but it's not prevention. It's risk reduction because true prevention means going to the root cause of the problem. Women and girls are not the root cause of the problem. When men and boys were focused on back in the day, it was almost always as perps or potential perps. So the spirit of the educational message to guys was, you better listen up. You better know the law in the state of Colorado. You better know what consent means. You better know that if you're with somebody and you're pushing forward sexually and you're not sure if they're consenting and you keep going, you could be crossing the line into committing sexual assault. You need to back off. And the problem with focusing on men that way and young men is a lot of men turn you off and tune you out and resent it. They're like, well, you why coming in here talking to me like this? And my goal was to get men to buy in rather than to be turned off. If the goal is to invite men into the conversation rather than indict them as potential rapists, there's got to be a better way. So what we did is we, we, we thought, OK, this a bystander way is a better way. And so what we did is we started talking about men as bystanders. And the word bystander is just a synonym for friend, teammate, classmate, colleague, coworker. It's not, there's no such thing as a bystander as far as I'm concerned. It's just another word for friend, teammate, college, colleague, coworker. And we started focusing on men as bystanders, and women too. And I'm focusing on men right now. And, Early on in the MVP model, it was only men. It became mixed gender, but I'm just focusing on men. 
but here's the thing. If you can imagine this triangle as a pyramid, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to finish this, and then I have one last piece about me too, and then I'll, and I'll stop, okay? Um, if you can imagine this triangle as a pyramid, and you can imagine the tip of the pyramid is an incident of sexual harassment, sexual assault, domestic violence. Um, it could be um, racist incident. It could be um, gay bashing, because conceptually it's all similar. That's an incident. But the base of the pyramid is a set of attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that create the context and foundation within which the abusive act takes place. That opens up a lot more space for what we're saying a bystander can do. So in other words, it's not just intervening at the point of attack. Because what's happened is some people have taken my teaching and others, and they've implemented it at the most superficial level. And so much of what now passes for quote unquote bystander intervention training is little more than what I refer to as glorified nightclub bouncer training. So we're training people, if you see something, say something. You know, if you see a situation, you're gonna jump in and stop it, here's your options, distract, deflect. It's like, this is not, to me, transformative educational practice. There's been a consensus in the engaging men, young men and boys space globally for about 20 years, and I'm part of this consensus. There's been a consensus in that space that the best way and the most effective way of engaging men on these matters, on, on sexual assault, uh, and domestic violence, but also men's violence against other men and men's violence against themselves or, or their bad health risk-taking behaviors, et cetera. The most effective programming and the most effective approach is what's called gender transformative programming and approach. You can Google it if you want. Gender transformative means helping men and young men and boys think about ways in which cultural ideologies and beliefs about manhood uh, negatively affect them in their relations with women, with other men, and with themselves. If it's not gender transformative, in other words, if you go in and talk gender neutrally and talk about building skills for intervention when it comes to cases of potential harm, but you don't talk honestly about the gender um, ideologies that, and sexual ideologies marbled in with racism and all these other isms, if you don't talk honestly about all that, then you're just skimming the surface. The one place in the world where people are engaging systematically in that superficial bystander intervention is the wealthiest country in the world, the United States of America, in the place where we could be doing the most transformative work, we're doing the least transformative work. So they're doing much more transformative work in the developing world initiatives. We're talking honestly about gender and masculinities, but the reason why so many people don't do it in this country, and I'm, make, I'm editorializing all over the place right now, is it because if people are worried that men are going to be react defensively, and if women are the only ones doing the training, and they're going into rooms full of men, if you start talking about gender and healthy masculinity, a lot of men are going to be turned off. They're going to be. When I started the MVP program back in '93, the reason for starting the program was because the status quo had failed. The status quo was women going into roomfuls of men, trying to educate them about sexual assault. So you'd have two women or one woman walking into a football team on a Thursday night, and she's doing the sexual assault training. It's a setup, and it's not fair, and it's pedagogically unsound, and no matter how talented that woman is, she's in a really difficult situation. I was like, this is wrong. If we were serious, if we are serious about dealing with these issues institutionally, University of Colorado and everywhere else needs to hire more men to do this. They need to hire former student athletes to work with student athletes. They need to former Greeks to work with the Greek system. There's so many basic pedagogical things that aren't being done in the, in the field right now that many of us think are obvious, and I'm saying this to you for, as probably more experienced than anybody in the country in working with and running programs that work with men, including in the sports culture, in the military, in the traditional guy cult, in the fraternity culture, in the traditional guy culture. And I know that if you do it right, it works. But you have to do it right. And people just continue to reproduce the superficial stuff and the, and the old problems of the old days. And it drives me crazy, as you can see. So I'm going to say one last thing. Because the, because the title of this talk is men and me too, <laughs> right? Possibilities and perils in the time of change. So bear with me, please. One last piece, and then I'll we'll say good, good night, if you will, or good morning. Um, there was a study done recently, maybe uh, eight months ago or so, about a Twitter a Twitter hashtag that was created in response to Me Too by a man in Australia. It's called. Hashtag how I will change. Okay, so he was trying to get men to respond on Twitter to the Me Too movement has you know put this stuff forward. How will men respond? And so it was hashtag how I will change. And this these, these researchers did this studied 
men's or people who identified as men's responses to that hashtag how I will change. And they found three general categories of men's response to how I will change. And I think it's useful to think about it in this way. I mean, there's other ways to think about it, but this is one way to think about it. The first response of men to the how I will change hashtag was in the general category, I will be a better ally. I'm going to learn more. I'm going to read more. I'm going to try to be more strong supporter of women's efforts and gender equality efforts and such. And um, I'm going to try to transmit to the next generation, to the extent that I have that platform, to the next generation a healthier understanding of what it means to be a man that doesn't involve you know, abusing women, et cetera. Okay, that was the number one. I want to be a better ally, stronger supporter of justice and gender justice. Second category of men's response to the how I will change hashtag was men who said, um, this is a problem I admit, you know, I acknowledge that it's a problem, but it's not my problem. And I resent to a certain extent people implying that it's my problem just because I happen to share the same secondary sex characteristics as the majority of perpetrators. And some of those men's attitude was encapsulated in the not all men hashtag. And I often say to men, I say as a piece of advice, unsolicited, I say, <laughs> don't say not all men. It makes you sound like an ass. It, no woman in history or man has ever said, all men are rapists. It's like this ridiculous, it makes you sound like you're defensive and ignorant. Don't say it and just listen to what the person is saying rather than be so jumping to the defensive reaction, not all men. But not all men does define some of the men in the second category's response, which is, I don't do this, it's not my issue. The third category of men's response to the how it will change hashtag is hostility directed towards any man who would speak positively and supportively of the how I will change hashtag. In other words, attacking the manhood of men who would be so soft and wimpy that they would say something supportive of women and want to be changing in a positive direction towards gender equality. So those those men would, were saying overtly, like, you know, I get called names like this all the time, mangina, beta males, um, soft, politically correct, all that kind of stuff. And some of those, and, and by the way, that kind of bullying language works for a lot of young men and older men. It works. The reason why they do it is because it works. And, the, and part of the reason why I talk about this as a leadership issue for men is that we have to have met more men who have the guts to fight back against those kind of bullying tactics that try to shut down men who want to speak for justice. Because a lot of men who do speak out on these matters get attacked verbally and other ways. And their quote unquote manhood or their heterosexuality is often the angle in. And again, some of, it, some of us, is, I mean, it doesn't affect me anymore at all, but a lot of men, it doesn't affect. Anyways, in addition, the men in this third category would say, would bring race and ethnicity into it when it was never part of the explicit discussion. And they would say, this is a problem for dark, basically dark-skinned men. It's those men. It's the other who are committing the violence. White guys aren't the problem. In other words, that level of both racism and denial that you often see, right? And this is a common thing. You, you understand, one of the ways that some white people deal with this issue is by saying, it's a, when men of color are abusive to, to women and girls, it's a cultural thing for those people. That's how they treat their women. When a white guy does it, it's almost always ascribed to individual characteristics, like he had a bad day, or he had a brain injury, he lost his job, he had a drinking problem, right? Even the social psychologists have a term for this. You know, it's called outgroup homogeneity bias. The outgroup homogeneity <laughs> bias. In other words, this is a predictable pattern of, in human civilization of people defining certain kinds of problems as representing a cultural issue for other people, but when it's their people, it's an individual problem, as opposed to being self-reflexive enough and honest enough to say it's a cultural problem from the dominant culture. Anyway, so these people in the third category, these men were, in addition, adding race and racist kind of thinking to their responses to the hashtag, uh, how I will change. So my argument is, okay, those are the three general categories. My argument is, we need to build the first category, right? We need to build the first category a lot bigger than it is because it's not big enough. And the place we're going to get most of the building on the first category, which is, you know, I want to be a stronger ally, I want to be better on these matters, is to pull people in the second category into the first category. I think the third category, not so, not so hopeful at the moment. In other words, a man who's already attacking the manhood of, of men who talk about this matters, these matters, might not be the, the most fertile ground for social change right now. 
But I think that there's a lot of men in the middle category. I think there's a lot of guys who say, these are issues, these are big issues, yeah, but it's not my issue. I think there's an awful lot of those men. The goal of, I think, my work and a lot of other people's work is to pull more men in that second category into the first category. Because the only way this stuff is going to really, really transform is if a critical mass of men join with the women who have been at the forefront of this work. If we get to the point where we have a critical mass of men joining with the women, then we'll have the tipping point and the massive change will happen very, very quickly. Um, but we have a long way to go between now and then. Thank you very much.